I'm Seth. And I'm Jonathan. And welcome to No Experts Allowed. You know what we love? The Bible. You know what we don't love? When people use the Bible to scare or hurt others instead of allowing it to transform them and their communities. So we're trying something different. Two Bible nerds hosting a podcast that isn't about technical details, but is about two simple questions. What's the story? And what's the point? One of us will prepare for the conversation. Let's call them the non-expert. The other will respond to the story as they hear it. We'll call them, and you, the storyteller. So we can show you that you don't need to be an expert to hear the Bible speak to our world. Join us. Let's tell a good story today. Hey, Jonathan. Hey, Seth. What's up? Not much. Just excited to be here with you. Same. It's always a pleasure. Thanks. I feel the same way. So here's a question just for you. Just for me? I can't wait. What would you do in this particular situation? Would you want to be a bird or a beetle, but you still have to go through your daily life a la Franz Kafka's The Metamorphosis? <laughs> Okay, clarifying question. Would I be okay. like a normal-sized bird or beetle, or would I be a Jonathan-sized bird or beetle and have to do my normal stuff? I think you would be Jonathan-sized. Oh my gosh, okay, that's not the answer I was expecting. <laughs> Man, would I still be able to communicate and just have yeah. like the other yeah. faculties of a bird or beetle? Yes. Because in, in the metamorphosis, doesn't he keep going to work? You know, he I think loses so. His, I think he does at the beginning, and then he like loses his job because he's a bug. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I would go with bird, just because. I mean, giant birds aren't that common, but they're not as horrifying as giant bugs, <laughs> and so. I feel like I could get away with a little bit more and still like make some things happen. I have to answer the phone a lot in my job, though. I don't know how I'd do that. I just have to like peck at the speakerphone option. And <laughs> <laughs> I and also then, think and then squawk at them. I also think flying as a. I know some beetles can fly at least, but flying as a bird again more normal. If you were a beetle that big and you flew like beetles fly, you'd like cause earthquakes with how <laughs> fast your wings were moving. <laughs> It'd be like a helicopter. Yeah. <laughs> do you think, since you've been primarily working from home, do you think you could get away with being transformed into a bird? Uh, could you just be I like, don't... oh, I can't, my camera's not working. I'm just going to zoom. Yeah. <laughs> You know, by phone today. <laughs> Maybe. I do squawk on a regular basis, too, so I think okay. I, could, I could get away with it. Wait, so what would you choose? Would you choose a bird as well? You know, I was, I was going to go with beetle, but your thing about it flying changed my mind. I think you're right. You can't fly if you're a beetle. Just like, picture like a human-sized beetle. <laughs> so I'm going to go with bird. You could oh even kind of type. Like pack yeah, the just, keyboard. Yeah, you could type like a lot of like greatest generation and baby boomers do. Exactly. Yeah. One one key at a time. They hunt and pack. Yep. Lots of love to the greatest generation and to baby boomers. Yes. Even those who don't type as well. Yeah, my grandma had this massive keyboard because her <laughs> eyes like was getting very bad at the end. So she could type, but each of the keys was probably like one and a half inches. Oh my gosh. <laughs> like one and a half inches square? Square. Yeah. I mean, it was huge. <laughs> Which is like, it was like impossible for like a regular person to type on. Because like, yeah, you couldn't spread your fingers out wide enough. <laughs> exactly. You had to do hunt and peck because it was like just massive. I feel like that's the kind of keyboard I'd want, though, if I was a bird. Yeah. Because I could true. be a little less precise with my pecking. That's true. Now I want to try to type an email with my nose and see how it would go. <laughs> also, you couldn't do, I guess you'd have to do caps lock, but how would you shift 
or like do anything oh, yeah, like that. true <laughs> push more than one, one button at once <laughs> either way if you're a bird or a beetle you're gonna get fired <laughs> yeah def- definitely well, i can't wait for people to chime in and tell us what we got wrong about the metamorphosis because i honestly yeah, I don't know i remember nothing else about that book same yeah other than apparently he turns into a bug and gets fired after a while. <laughs> I think. I think that's what happens. <laughs> well, I'm most excited to hear about how this connects to our scripture for this week. So can I go ahead and read it? Yeah, that would be great. Okay. This is Psalm 98. Sing a new song to the Lord, who has done marvelous things, whose right hand and holy arm have won the victory. O Lord, You have made known your victory. You have revealed your righteousness in the sight of the nations. You remember your steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. Shout with joy to the Lord, all you lands. Lift up your voice, rejoice, and sing. Sing to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the voice of song. With trumpets and the sound of the horn, shout with joy before the king, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who dwell therein. Let the rivers clap their hands and let the hills ring out with joy before the Lord, who comes to judge the earth. The Lord will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. Mm. A great psalm. Love some of the imagery there. But before we get into it, what version did you choose this week and why did you choose it? This is from the ELCA's hymnal. They have translations of all of the psalms. And I particularly like their translations because they're all gender inclusive. Mm. And one of one of the ways that they try to do that is they often will change the perspective from from he and she to you which i i like in this instance i think it makes it like seem uh, just like a little bit more personal so Mm. i think it does a great job with that this newest iteration of the elca's hymnal is the first one to have all of the psalms in the past they only did like selections of them Mm. so if you have a cranberry lutheran hymnal there's also a red one but that's the old one so if you have okay. the cranberry if upgraded to cranberry i yes. see excellent yes. so if you have the cranberry that has all of the psalms in it at the beginning of the song section which is interesting like it the psalms form the first 150 songs of the hymnal hmm that makes sense yeah and in the image that you sent me i see a lot of like line breaks and things that are in the in the middle of lines and i'm assuming that's related to how these psalms might actually be sung that there are certain lines and that you would or numbers of syllables that you would sing and then reset the the musical pattern and the lyrical pattern so that's helpful i was actually going to ask about that exactly right you said that you really like the the imagery is there one in particular that sticks out to you? Well, there's a series of them throughout. Any time in the Hebrew Bible, especially, when creation is invited to be part of the action, I love it. I love that, actually, in Genesis 1, even, where you know God says to parts of creation to make more creation. And so I, I, it's just a really powerful image to me. And because of that, Verses 7 and 8, I think, really resonated with me. Letting the sea roar and all that fills it, and then let the rivers clap their hands and the hills ring out with joy. Those images, oh, I just, it's such a beautiful personification of some of the most beautiful parts of the world, and I, I love it. It's so good. I love the rivers clapping their hands. Like, as I think about that, that's what it sounds like like that what a good description of that like when the water's real rough right yeah 
or running over rocks and kind of tumbling down waterfalls and things. That's right. It sounds like a crowd in raucous applause. Exactly. Consistently. Yeah, I loved that. I like the different instruments. It, but it always makes me wonder, like when we translate the instruments in Psalms, it's always like kind of a projection because it's, it's hard to know what instruments were available and what exactly what instrument they mean in Hebrew. Yeah. So it's, it, it's always interesting to me to see like what the translation substitutes, like the harp and the trumpet and the horn, like... Like those are obviously like modern instruments, right? That yeah. they like that they put back on it. But I, I mean, the idea stands, right? That we use like all of our, all of our musical instruments and abilities, and and even our voices, to praise. Wish I could play the harp. I know <laughs> that's random, but <laughs> you're thinking about something. Oh, I was sorry. I just pulled up accordance and was looking at the words for the for harp and for the harp and the trumpets yeah and it's actually i mean how interesting this is i think depends on how interested you are in this nerdy you are (laughs) yeah but the the intro i think the thing that's interesting this comes through in the septuagint the greek translation of this psalm the the hebrew is closer to what we read in terms of the trumpets and the sound of the horn in verse 8. The Greek Septuagint renders it with um, the trumpets of metal and the trumpets of horn. Ah. So, I mean, it, it gets at kind of the same thing, but the word yeah. trumpets is actually in that verse twice, which okay. seems, yeah. <laughs> seems like a little bit too much. I think of trumpets as you know these bright brass metal instruments and i don't know what a trumpet in the day of the psalmist would have looked like for her you know it just feels it feels like i connect with it though because i have such a strong image in my mind and i don't know if that's helpful or if that's actually creating a barrier to me getting the imagery that's going on here yeah i like the idea of trumpets of bone is that what it says that's probably or trumpets of horn. Trumpets yeah. of horn. That's probably like what they would have in mind, right? Like, yeah, yeah. That's really interesting. There's also a lot, though. I mean, we talked about the imagery, the instruments. There's a lot here about God, though. Like, there's, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like it is as Psalms, I guess, ought to be, <laughs> rightfully. <laughs> praising God, describing God's character, describing things God will do. And I'm particularly struck by the very end that God will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. And the fact that all of this praise, all of this glory is culminating in God coming to judge the earth. I don't know. Maybe there's something about judgment that feels a little off-putting to me, but... It's an interesting culmination of this experience that's, hey, offer praise, whether you're a river or whether you can play the trumpet of metal or trumpet of horn. (laughs) You know, God deserves praise because God's coming to judge the earth. Yeah, it seems so counter to these images of judgment that are really scary. Right? Like, this is like, this is celebration, knowing that the judgment is coming. This isn't yeah. like, oh, no, I kind of want it to come. It's going to be a disaster. This is sheer joy that the judgment is coming. I think that's what's fascinating to me about the psalm, that all all of the this amazing imagery builds to that last line, just like you said. The Lord's going to judge the world with righteousness. I also appreciate how the rivers praise in a way that's like specific to rivers, right? And the hills ring out with joy and they praise in a way that's specific to hills. Because I'm I'm not very musical. So like if we've got to sing a new song to the Lord, it's gonna be a disaster for me. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta I gotta do it some way that's like specific to Seth. Not that's not about trumpets, right? Like 
I can do a pretty good me- like imitation trumpet. You can, I was going to say, you've got a great mouth trumpet, and I now can. I think we need a sampling of it. Okay. Can't get over it. See, why are you even complaining? You can. You I can, can do play, the mouth trumpet. You could play the mouth trumpet to the Lord. <laughs> if I were translating the Septuagint, I would have put in there the trumpet of the mouth. <laughs> <laughs> the trumpets of metal, trumpets of the horn, trumpets of the mouth. Yep. Amazing. And years later, people have been like trumpets of the mouth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been. People would have written dissertations on that about what the trumpet of the mouth is. <laughs> and it would just be been because you were feeling left out by the other <laughs> instruments that were mentioned. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Some like ego trip insecurity <laughs> thing it caused problems for so many people. Ugh. This is this is really a lovely psalm though. It's so rooted in Israel's story. It's rooted in a time of of victory. Yeah. Which is so interesting when I I always find that juxtaposition interesting when remembering that Israel's actual history is not marked by a lot of victory. Yeah. You know, it's it's by like kind of finagling their way in like they are not a dominant power at any point in their story. If anything, they're just a little more deft and subversive when they're at their strongest they're not dominant yeah they're like very they're like tricky they like work in the the ancient near east like kind of like through these roundabout tricky ways i like how this psalm isn't tricky like this is like pretty clear what's happening like this is like the opposite of trying to hide it like hide the joy and the the praise and the yeah like when you're when you're playing the trumpet it's pretty obvious i think is there this is i guess we're moving like toward application is there like a particular way that you gravitate toward praise is there like a way you you like to praise I, I mean, I am a bit more musical. I, I yeah, you play are. piano and guitar, and I do sing some, but usually supportive vocals like harmony or you know coming in a chorus type of thing. And so, th- and that is meaningful for me. One of the songs that we just sang today actually was this old spiritual song called "I've Just Come from the Fountain." We actually had mm. a baptism today, uh, which was wonderful. And just talking about how sweet God's name is. And it's just this call and response. And that actually transitions to me in another way that I I feel like praise resonates deeply with me is, is in community with others. Like when we are, honestly, when we're around the table or have drinks in hand and are just sharing things that are going on, even when those things are hard, it's like this moment of celebration of, wow, I'm so glad I've got this group to walk through this with me. Mm. So it's that experience of sharing things in community, even if it's not like me audibly saying praise God or something like that in response, it still comes through for me as like something that demonstrates why God is worthy of praise. Yeah, it's not just in these specific acts of praise right that are like identifiably praised by people from the outside right it's like it's like in just being in community with others that you find like a sense of praise yeah i like that i like that's meaningful that's helpful to me as someone who can't sing or play any instruments other than the mouth trumpet very well and for our listeners who don't know jonathan also recorded the music for our intro and outro that's true well i'm thinking about that so you do have a lot of musical talent 
Well, one of the things actually, Seth, that I noticed recently, though, we actually just had, we have a piano in our house. It's a small, upright piano that Abby's parents very generously gave to us after it was in their house for a long time. We just had it tuned for the first time in a while. And when the tuner came, he did something to access the part of the piano, the strings and everything to get it tuned. There's like a whole front piece that comes off. So rather than just sitting and looking at music or sitting and looking at the wood piece of the piano, when you sit and remove this piece, you're actually looking at kind of the uh, guts of the piano. Yeah. As as you're playing, you're seeing the the hammers hit the strings and as you're pushing the pedals, you're seeing all the things that are happening. And that's honestly one of the things about music that is so worshipful to me. It's all the things that go into making a song a song. Mm -hmm. Hmm. And especially when that song is sung in a group. Like that experience is in that same way is never going to happen again because people come and go. People are in different moods and have different attitudes. And for that one moment of singing that song, you're brought together in praise in a way that's unique to that particular situation. <laughs> <laughs> and so when, I, when I'm sitting there playing the piano, when I'm not looking down to see what I'm playing, I'm trying to watch what's happening because it's like, oh man, I'm doing this one little part, but so much more is happening. Hmm. You know, I know how to push the keys, but I didn't build the piano to make it make music yeah and in a lot of ways kind of experiencing praise and community that way feels really similar to me like yeah there are things that i do and you know there are things i do that often are labeled as the important part of you know of what singing together is all about but i can't have a corporate worship experience without other people yeah. whether that's other people playing instruments yeah other people singing whatever type of noise or whatever key their noise is in <laughs> you know making that noise joyfully is is a really powerful experience and i don't think i realized how much i missed it until pretty recently even in our psalm all the praisers are in the plural i think yeah like which is meaningful shout with joy to the lord all you lands with trumpets let the sea roar and all that fills it and the world and those who dwell therein. Let the rivers clap their hands and let the hills ring out. Yeah, there's something about praise. It seems like it's always communal. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. And like we talked about in our last episode, it's almost like the invitation to offer God praise is another way that our love for God becomes love for neighbor yeah. because for that moment in that time and space, we're recognizing this is something that we're all trying to sing together. And maybe some songs, some statements of praise are harder to utter at certain times or for certain members of the community at a particular time. But still we are holding all of that. We're holding all of our baggage that's loaded up together. We're holding that in one moment for that purpose. Even if as soon as the song is over, we're back to our <laughs> differences and divisions. Or even in the midst of the song, yeah. if you're mad about how loud the drums are or, yeah. <laughs> or that yeah. the organist is playing too slow, you know, whatever it is there's still so much possibility and potential in those experiences. And then as, as it finishes, it's gone. There's mm -hmm. something beautiful to that cycle. The only thing I'll add is you can praise when you're alone, but join in with all of the people who are praising across the world. I think like there's, there's something about praise that's impossible to do alone. You can do it when you're alone, but you never do it alone. Mm. Yeah. At, ver at the very least, you're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses who have been praising and will continue to do so. That's a, that's a good word. Since that seems like a good place to end, will you pray with me? I'd love that. 
Gracious God, we sing to you in tune or out. We play for you on guitars, organs, and hammered dulcimers. We shout for joy in all the various languages across the universe. For you are the God of our salvation, and you have done marvelous things. Amen. Amen. To our listeners, thanks for joining us. Be sure to subscribe and tune in for our next episode. Jonathan, what story will we tell next week? Next week, we're heading back to the Gospel of John. We're going to look at John 17, verses 6 to 19, where Jesus prays for unity. But until then, leave us a review and find us on Twitter and Instagram to continue the conversation. Thanks for walking us through that story, Seth. Thanks for helping me tell it.